health chiefs today gave their verdict on the AIDS virus man. They believe he didn't do it deliberately. Irresponsible, yes. Willful intent, no. They refuse to name the man who has infected four women with the HIV virus without telling them he's a carrier. They'll take no legal action against him, but they will encourage him to practice safe sex. The woman at the centre of the AIDS drama left home in Birmingham today with a police escort after she was besieged by reporters wanting her to name the alleged culprit. Earlier, Lynette Russell publicly announced that she was one of the man's four known victims. She claimed he knew he was HIV positive, but did not tell her and did not suggest taking precautions. She described her feelings towards him in a radio interview. Just feel sorry for him. You know, he needs help. I mean, he's no good locking them up. You can't lock someone up, can you? I mean, but I, I don't know what sort of help can he give someone like that. He must be a very lonely, very desperate man. It was sort of licensed to kill type of thing. I don't know. Doctors and health chiefs who know the man's identity called an emergency meeting today to discuss the case. Afterwards, they described his failure to warn his partners or to follow safe sex advice. They had formed the view that his failure to comply with advice was a matter of regrettable irresponsibility rather than a willful intention to infect. They said nothing could be done legally or medically to restrain him and all that's planned is for counsellors to try and encourage him to change his lifestyle. I think that we're taking the appropriate course of action that at this juncture the first thing we should do is get back to the individual concerned and really reiterate how important it is that he takes a more responsible attitude towards his sexual life. In America, anyone who knowingly passes on the AIDS virus can be prosecuted, such as this man who's currently on $20 million bail. But the government here is wary of following suit. We have got to uh, try to determine exactly what may or may not have happened and, and how it stands against the laws that exists at the moment. It doesn't uh, lend itself, I believe, to, to a quick uh, or easy solution. You'd have to prove that they didn't convey the information to the person concerned. Um, you would have to prove that they, they were the actual source of transmission. And you'd have to prove some sort of willful intent. So today's developments will do little to allay the concerns of women who fear they may have already come into contact with this man or may become victims in the future. Simply, health chiefs can do nothing other than advise people to practice safer sex. Terry Lloyd, ITN, Birmingham. Reports to come in the early evening news. GP's decision, we won't come out at night. Going home, the hero of the sea rescue. And Britain's Jeremy Bates knocks out the number seven seed. Family doctors have voted to end giving their patients 24-hour cover themselves. They say a 72-hour working week, including time on call, is too long. Stand-in doctors would provide nighttime cover instead if the government approves. The vote was overwhelming, the message to the government clear. Britain's doctors say they should no longer have to bear sole responsibility for their patients 24 hours a day. Uh, doctor here. At present, GPs can make some use of deputising services, like this one operating in Leeds. Shall I check your ear first, shall we? It employs doctors in six-hour shifts to answer out-of-hours calls from about half the city's practices. It means one doctor can do the work of ten. There's nothing worse to a GP than to be out at three o'clock in the morning and pass a colleague from the next practice down the road going in the opposite direction down the same street. It's a total nonsense. We just do it far more efficiently. But the government puts a limit on the use doctors can make of deputising services. Patients, they say, need the reassurance of a familiar face. But even though it won't concede the principle of 24-hour responsibility, the government says it will now look at ways of helping overworked doctors. Harry, is this the end of the traditional family doctor? Well, John, to some extent we have already seen the end of the traditional family doctor, certainly as far as nighttime call-outs is concerned. It's been estimated that in Britain's cities, more than half the GPs now make use of the sort of deputising service that we've been talking about. But the BMA have been at pains today to say, stress that uh, they're not talking about ending nighttime cover. What they're talking about is providing good nighttime cover and trying to make it better so that the patient gets an awake, alert doctor at whatever time of the night or day he calls them. Because the number of nighttime call outs to Britain's doctors is increasing, and doctors, like the rest of us, need a good night's sleep if they're to perform properly the next day. But what of the argument that it's the family doctor who knows the history of the patient best? 
Well, the counter-argument is that anyone who has to call a doctor out because they're so ill in the middle of the night probably won't mind who that doctor is as long as he can diagnose them and treat them properly. And you must remember that even your own family doctor doesn't bring your medical records with him if he's called out in the middle of the night. Thank you, Harry. One of the teenagers who survived two days at sea in a wrecked speedboat in the Bristol Channel went home today after just one night in hospital. The other survivor is still recovering. Gareth Smith left hospital today unable to come to terms with the fact that his best friend, Simon Roberts, who left their boat to swim for help last Saturday, hadn't yet been found. Gareth thought that Simon was well and he'd called the Coast Guard. They knew the helicopters were in the air, they could see them. The ship passed him, boat. But as if nobody knew they were there. She was devastated when the search was called off. If you could have walked that water and searched every inch, you would have done it for the rest of your life. As Gareth was driven home tonight, Coast Guard said they were satisfied they'd acted correctly. The other survivor, Stephen Evans, is coming out of intensive care today and is said to be progressing well. Vernon Mann, ITN, North Devon. Wimbledon now and something to savour. It doesn't often happen. A top seed knocked out by a Briton. The number seven seed Michael Chang went out in straight sets to Jeremy Bates. Also today, John McEnroe beat Brazil's Luis Matar. In the women's singles, Steffi Graf had an easy win, but Britain's Joe Dury went out. Day two of Wimbledon belonged to Britain. Jeremy Bates, for so long a journeyman of the world tennis circuit, finally turned in a world-beating performance. He took on the number seven seed Michael Chang and raced into a two-set lead. The third and decisive set was a tense affair as Bates, who turned 30 a few days ago, struggled to finish the match. Chang, the French Open winner in 89, saved one match point. Then Bates made the breakthrough to achieve his best ever singles victory. One of the best wins I've ever had, you know, in 12 years. There's, there's no doubt in it, and I'm, I'm delighted, but it's not going to change the pace of tennis just overnight. But for a couple of days at least, a British player can help to inspire the next generation. I think all of us wish there was more competition and, uh, you know, 100 or 15 British players directly into the main draw. And if, uh, if that was the case, then, then the whole environment would be a lot better. Five. The environment around court one was less healthy today. McEnroe was back on court, the tantrums of his early years replaced by a subdued bad temper, which rarely caused offence. Part of that was due to the opposition, Brazil's top player crumbling in four sets. Peter Staunton, ITN Sport, Wimbledon. At least 15 nurses are being questioned by detectives investigating the death of a patient at a top security hospital. Brian Marsh died last month after a violent disturbance at Rampton Hospital in Nottinghamshire. Rampton inmate Brian Marsh died after being restrained by nursing staff in the secure hospital's dining area. An inquest heard he'd suffered a heart attack, but his family commissioned a second post-mortem and this morning police began interviewing 15 staff about Mr Marsh's death. Police say they expect to make more arrests and will send a file on his death to the Director of Public Prosecutions. Mr Marsh's family believe the heart attack may have been induced by his being restrained. There were certain um, restraint techniques which were used upon Brian um, and uh, shortly thereafter Brian had a heart attack. Now how closely connected the restraint techniques and Brian's death is a matter which is under investigation. Well, we gather that there's been a second post-mortem, the results of which have been known, but we ourselves don't know anything about that. Um, and the police have asked for 16 members of staff to come to various police stations to be questioned. A few days after the original incident, the authorities here at Rampton launched an internal investigation into the events leading up to Mr Marsh's death. At the time, they stressed that they believed there were no suspicious circumstances. Jonathan Munro, ITN, at Rampton Hospital. The African National Congress will announce tonight whether it's prepared to carry on talking to the South African government after the Boy Patong massacre. Police today arrested scores of people suspected of taking part in the attack. 
A crucial day of decision for Nelson Mandela and his executive. Facing them, a stark choice between negotiating the government out of power or trying to remove it by mass action. Senior members of the executive argued that breaking off relations completely would only delay the reform process. One option, to suspend talks until the government met certain conditions, including better control of the security forces. While ANC rank and file urged their leaders to take more radical action, the government made a last appeal for a return to the negotiating table. We have only one government, only one South Africa. We owe it to the South to put our political differences aside and get to the hard core of this violence and speak straightforwardly to one another, even if it hurts, it's not too late to do that. It is never too late. Meanwhile, it was announced that the notorious Kwamadala hostel, whose residents have been accused of carrying out the Boy Patong massacre, is to be closed, an apparent attempt to remove one source of aggravation in the political standoff. America's notorious mafia boss John Gotti fell silent this afternoon, lost for words as a judge sentenced him to life in prison. The Teflon Don had finally come unstuck. Mayhem outside Brooklyn's federal courthouse as John Gotti gets life and his supporters cry foul. They rushed police lines, then tried to break into the court to free the mafia boss. Riot police were called, Mafia supporters arrested, John Gotti's family was angry. I'm ashamed to say I'm an American in this country. Gotti, who had dressed immaculately and smiled as he was sentenced, was driven away to life in a maximum security prison. There, he'll hear whether a judge agrees with his lawyers that his trial was unfair because jurors were intimidated into convicting him. The FBI says Gotti, who killed his boss to take over America's biggest crime family, is still giving the orders from behind bars. His sentencing is expected to spark a power struggle within a mafia in disarray. After today's arrests, Gotti's supporters smashed windows and overturned cars. The verdict on America's most notorious crime boss is less likely to be overturned. Bill Neely, ITN, Washington. Here it's going to cost a good deal more to insure homes and cars, about £10 a month more for the average family. Insurers say it's because they've been paying out record amounts on claims. The insurance industry had its worst year ever in 1991. The five biggest companies lost over a million pounds a day. Crime soared with claims for household break-ins jumping by 75%. Motor thefts were up by a third. The insurers are asking policyholders to pay the price. This will be the third year running that premiums have risen sharply. Last year, the average driver was charged £283 for car insurance, though many paid far in excess of that. This year, the average is nearer £350. With the new increase, that figure will top £400. Consumer groups reacted strongly. In a word, it's horror at the sheer scale of the price increases coming after two previous years of very high rises. Bad weather and a string of natural disasters have also played their part in inflicting unprecedented losses on the insurance companies. But that's no comfort for those who face what seem to be ever-mounting insurance bills. Greg, why do premiums keep going up? Well, John, there's no doubt, as the insurance companies claim, that we are paying for a large rise in crime-related losses. But we're also paying to some extent for the insurance company's previous bad judgment. In motor insurance, for example, until a few years ago, many companies were only too willing to expand aggressively. Now they're trying to claw back their losses. They also insure building societies against people defaulting on their mortgages. And we all know what's happened in that market. I suppose the only comfort is that once the insurance companies begin to move back into profit, then premium rises should begin to tail off. Is our insurance expensive compared to the rest of Europe? Well, it's difficult to get valid comparisons on household insurance, but for motor insurance, we do pretty well. For young drivers of small vehicles, we're about the fifth most expensive in the community. In Ireland, you could pay up to three times as much. For experienced drivers of larger cars, we actually do very well. Only Greece in the community is cheaper than the UK. Thank you, Greg. The main news is no action to be taken against the Birmingham HIV virus man. That's the early evening news until 5.40 tomorrow. Bye-bye.
Hello, good evening. Well, there's been some rain around today and we're expecting a little more in the far northwest during the next 24 hours or so. But as far as the weekend goes, things are shaping up very nicely indeed. And in fact, temperatures are on the up, soaring well into the mid-20s. So whether you're in the park, pub or simply on the patio, then at least you can relax about the weather being good. For the moment, though, we're troubled by a whole pile of cloud. This is the way our cloud scan sequence picked up on the cloud as far as today went. Very dull, dismal start to the day, then a few breaks appearing in the cloud. On the whole, a dry weather picture, but sunshine very much at a premium. So as far as tonight's weather goes, again, we've got spits and spots of drizzle troubling the very far northwest. On the whole, a dry and fairly cloudy night, and temperatures dipping to around 10 degrees or 15 Fahrenheit terms. So as we go into tomorrow, once again we do so on a cloudy note. The most favoured spots as far as tomorrow's early sunshine goes are the eastern fringe of Scotland as well as the southeast of Northern Ireland. Bear in mind spits and spots of drizzle for the very far northwest. But it's very much an improving, brightening sort of a picture as we go into the afternoon. The cloud tending to lift and some fairly good bursts of sunshine coming through. But very much like today, that sunshine could well prove fairly hit and miss. And then what happens during the course of the day? Well, the cloud and drizzle in the very far northwest slowly moves southeastwards, tending to weaken and fizzle out as it comes, so most of Scotland ought to hang on to fairly dry weather. As you'd expect, temperatures at their very best, where the sunshine does actually peep through, round about the low 20s or the high 60s, and at least the winds are looking light. But I'm afraid to say pollen levels remain high. <laughs> You can't put a price on clean air, so we haven't. When you buy a new Fiat with a catalytic converter, the cat comes free. And if you trade in your old car, we'll give you up to a thousand pounds more than it's worth. So now you can cut air pollution without paying through the nose. How can we at Midland improve our service? Meet the public. Why don't they speak plain English? You can be in there half an hour before you get seen to. I'm not totally against the bank's charging. It's when you don't know what they're charging you for. I reckon I'm a human being, not a number. Wow. Reword everything they write. It's all pompous nonsense. Glad to see. Oh, yes. The letters should be uh, better written and not snotty. I wish they'd say sorry when they mess things up. Midland is committed to being as straight with you as you have been with us. Midland, the listening bank. Why are we wearing these, then? Because now we've become major television celebs, we have to take certain precautions. Celebs? Flash bulbs, bright lights. Oh, sounds very tiring. Will we still get our Optrex? Magnums of it. Ooh, think I'm going to like being a celebs. <laughs> Optrex, are your eyes trying to tell you something? <laughs> keeping pace with every new development. From the very dawn of motoring, there's been no holding this tiger. Now observe him. Married, mortgaged, and like any proud father, worried about the world in which his children will be growing up. No wonder, then, that Esso were the first to have unleaded at every service station. And no wonder you'll still find Esso ahead of the game in cutting down petrol emissions. Our friend here has always meant the very best in performance. Now he means a whole lot more. A new generation of Esso. For every new generation. Snowball, please. Oh, and a foster for me, please. Don't you just hate it when that happens? Fosters, don't you just love it? Tonight, monkey business. A Sussex firm is accused of exploitation. The family who were flooded out by the local water company. Taking the plunge to raise money for sick children.
and the woman who's got designs on a tattoo record. Good evening. A Sussex firm which imports monkeys for use in research laboratories is at the centre of a row over allegations of cruelty. An animal rights campaigner got a job with Shamrock Great Britain Limited, one of the country's biggest suppliers of wild and captive monkeys. He claims the animals endure months of misery in appalling conditions. And this afternoon, a South East MP called for an end to what he described as a trade in cruelty. Viewers may find some of the scenes in Hugh Kirby's report distressing. This afternoon, there was very little to see at the monkey farm run by Shamrock Great Britain Limited. There never is. What happens in this secretive compound happens behind closed doors, protected by a double ring of barbed wire. This film was taken by undercover anti-vivisectionist Terry Hill, who worked inside for nine months and supplied to TVS and ITV's World in Action programme. It's not alleged that Shamrock is breaking the law, but animal rights campaigners claim the monkeys are kept in cramped windowless huts that many never reach the laboratory at all. I myself have had to kill animals at Shamrock Farm. Um, I was asked uh, to give a lethal injection into one animal. Um, there was a program for killing ten animals for the reason that they were just too thin. They'd been on site for far too long. They weren't being sold and they were costing the company money, so they had to be killed. This afternoon, the whole business of breeding and importing monkeys for research came under attack in the Commons. I'm absolutely horrified about the trade in basically monkeys going to research laboratories because of the cruelty involved and because of the filthy way in which the whole business is done. I think very few people are aware that we have tens of thousands of these animals who are in fact trapped abroad, brought in the most appalling conditions. They come to laboratories in Britain. Round about four out of every five die in the process. There's no suggestion that Shamrock is operating improperly but animal rights campaigners say the rules must be changed. The law is simply um, too weak in Britain uh, because it allows such suffering to go on. Not only that, but these animals are going off often to be used in tests for completely irrelevant things, um, such as tests on food substances, warfare agents. Home office statistics show that 3,600 primates are used annually in laboratory experiments. Some medical opinion regards the tests as vital to develop life-saving drugs. Shamrock is one of the biggest suppliers. Despite repeated requests for interviews, no one from Shamrock has been available for comment. Hugh Kirby, coast to coast, at the Shamrock Monkey Farm near Henfield. A Kent couple have been flooded out of their home and they're blaming the local water company. Alan and Kay Carolan complained when their water supply was cut off and applied for it to be reconnected. It was, but as Paul Beard reports, they got a lot more water than they bargained for. Once these furnishings were among Kay and Alan Carolan's most prized possessions. Now they lie soaked and rotting in their back garden. The damage was caused after the couple fell behind with their water rates and had their supply cut off. It was reconnected after they pointed out they had a nine-year-old asthmatic daughter. But the problem was there was no one in the house at the time and a ball cock in the supply tank had stuck. The result was a cascade of water through the living room ceiling. When I walked into the living room, I thought we'd been vandalised because all the plants and ornaments and everything were just smashed all over the floor. And it was just a total mess. I came in and it was just like a waterfall coming through the rooms. The ceilings was down and just devastation, really. That's what you can see inside. But the water companies say while they regret what's happened, the damage really can't be blamed on them. Mrs. Carolyn did ask us to turn the water on. Um, an inspector went along turned the water on and in fact listened or sounded the pipes to make sure there in fact were no leaks in the household. If there were leaks or appeared to be leaks, he would have turned the water off. And in this case, as far as he was concerned, everything was satisfactory. The couple, though, say if that had happened, the official would have heard water dripping in the bath because of a worn-out washer on the tap. And they say they've been badly treated. Up until five weeks ago, we had carpets on the floor and furniture to sit on. Now we've got nothing. The water company point out they only cut supplies off to 34 out of 79,000 people in the past year. And had the Carolans paid their water rates, the situation wouldn't have arisen in the first place. 
Paul Beer, coast to coast, Folkestone. Shops and small businesses in the southeast are still going bust, despite those hopes of an economic revival after the Tory election victory. Traders say shoppers still aren't spending money. Experts say the recession in the southeast is far from over. Ray Rogers reports. East Grinstead in Sussex, all too typical of so many towns in the region. Shop after shop is closing down. Some traders blame lack of customers on unemployment or the fear of it. People have got the money, but they're concerned about whether they've got their jobs. And this is a situation we've never seen before, and certainly not in this part of the country. You've never seen that before? Not unemployment, the way it has been affecting us around here for the last two years, no. Other traders blame banks for their lack of support due to spectacular bad debts with big business. They've made some very big errors, and uh, it seems like the small business is now paying for it, which is what we see in East Grinstead because of their... Um, Inadequacies in the past, you know, small businesses are now paying for it in the future. The East Grinstead Chamber of Commerce says high rents are another factor behind the closures. Probably three quarters of the shops that are empty now are empty because of the end of a lease has come and the the price that the landlord's asking is just too much for the business. But if landlords have got to increase their rents because of the recession and the shopkeepers just can't afford to pay those rents because they haven't got customers. What is the answer? Well, the answer is hopefully the, the recession will be easing by then in three or four years' time, hopefully, but I've got a sneaking suspicion that it won't. Outside the southeast, the further you get away, the, the less the recession has bitten. Uh, and today there are still signs of rising unemployment, house prices, house values uh, are still falling. Uh, there's no sign of an upturn in the housing market. So there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot... Uh, or there's a con continuing lack of consumer confidence in the southeast. Even when the recession is lifted, the customers will come too late for many shops. Ray Rogers, Coast to Coast, East Grinstead. Members of a Maidstone Health Club have thrown themselves off a 200-foot bridge to raise money for charity. They decided to have a go at bungee jumping, leaping into space with only a long elastic strap to save them from hitting the ground. They were raising money for an appeal to provide young leukaemia sufferers with a special ambulance. Lloyd Bracey reports. The length some people will go to. For David Gadsby, about 200 feet. For Jean and Timmy, about 40 miles. They're going to London's Great Ormond Street Hospital, where Timmy recently finished a course of treatment for leukaemia. <laughs> David is one of a group of fundraisers who've just come back, all of them, from a weekend-sponsored bungee jumping in France, raising money for an ambulance, which will mean that young leukaemia patients don't have to rely on public transport when they go for life-saving treatment. When you've left the hospital after ha perhaps a day's treatment, you know, to drag them back through the stations and hope that the train's going to come on time. Um, and they can't really sleep on the trains, sometimes they're full up anyway. Um, it's a frightful journey, it's dreadful. The appeal is the work of a dedicated fundraiser whose own grandson had leukaemia. With our ambulance, at least we can take them from door to door service. They, uh, if they want to take mum along, then they can do it. And if there are other children in the family, they can take the other children. That's going to take a lot of stress off. And the child can lay down coming back from uh, having their chemotherapy. That must be a relief in itself. For children like Bevan, whose leukaemia was diagnosed 18 months ago, the ambulance could be a lifesaver. We didn't know how to get round town, so we was a couple of hours driving round. You know, and it was a case of life and death when he first got diagnosed. The night before they said, you know, it's touch and go whether he makes it through. So it's all very traumatic and it's extra pressure you can do without. Now they must find £20,000 for the vehicle, thousands more to run it. Professional ambulance drivers are helping. Dealing with children that have got leukaemia or carcinoma uh, is a very emotive subject and I think everybody would want to give the best that's possible. Unfortunately, we do live in a society where money is the, the controlling influence. And I think that what Peggy is proposing um, 